Good morning, everyone. I encourage you to open your Bibles to John in chapter 4. The Gospel of John in chapter 4. If you weren't here last week, uh, we began a series of studies on evangelism. Uh, last week, we, we just took a survey of the signs of the times and different ways that we can adapt our approach to improve uh, being able to reach the lost. And we want to continue that series uh, this, this morning. The apostles were told uh, right before Jesus ascended into heaven to the right hand of the throne of God, they were told to preach the gospel to every cre creature. They were told to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that He commanded them. Now, after Stephen's death, and that's exactly what the apostles did, they went to Jerusalem, they, they opened the, the gates of the kingdom, uh, and Christians were born. The church was founded there. Now, after Stephen's death, he was stoned, and the disciples were dispersed abroad. From Jerusalem, uh, the, the authorities were trying to stamp out the fire of Christianity, but in so stamping out the fire, they only spread it. And so all of those Christians that were being persecuted by people like Saul of Tarsus and, and others, were scattered. And they went about, Luke says, preaching the word. And so it, it doesn't, you know, you don't have to be a genius to figure out. This, this is the biblical pattern. This is what we are to do. Christians are to go out and make Christians. Disciples of Jesus are to go out and make disciples of Jesus. We see our role. We see the blessing and the privilege entering into this work of God. And we see our responsibility. And we also see through, uh, through these examples and others that our discipleship, whether or not Jesus is our Lord and we are following Him, really depends upon us spreading this message. And we want to, I think we all want to do that. We want to be better at that. We want to be more effective. And we want to be zealous about, about preaching to others and teaching others and showing them Christ in us and showing them what they could have if Christ would be in them. We want to do that as effectively as, as possible, but there does come some point in the discussion, okay, you know, I'm, I'm on board, now how do I do that? You know, do, do you have any examples? Can you show me how to do that? And at least for me, when I became a Christian, I don't know how it, how it was for you. I, I understood my responsibility, but that's where I was. I just had no idea how to do this. And most of us, if you're like me, what you want is some sort of step-by-step, one-size-fits-all approach. You know, if I get into a Bible study or I get into a discussion, just tell me what scriptures to use in, in, in what order. You know, give me some kind of biblical algorithm. Give me some kind of flow chart. You know, he asked this question, so I read this scripture. And then if he responds this way, then I go over here. If he responds this way, then I go over here. That's, that, that's, what, I, that's what I wanted, but, but brethren, I've searched, and that doesn't exist. <laughs> and so there are, and there are some books that, that, that are helpful and some books that aren't. But the best examples we have are right here in the Bible. And... The Bible isn't written like some sort of scientific formula. The Bible isn't written like some sort of code that can unlock or, or you know, break the, the security on a sinner's heart. And so that's, we can't approach it in that way. But it does give us very valuable principles. It does give us many examples of personal evangelism, things that regular human beings are capable of doing, people like you and I. And what I would like to do over the next several weeks is set the bar as high as we possibly can and look to Jesus. Jesus was the greatest evangelist. He was the best example of how to convert people. Everything this man did was preaching the gospel. Every encounter with another person, he was preaching the gospel. He saw sinners as lost. He saw his role as, as a savior. And, and he should be our standard. Now we can do a whole lot worse than Jesus, but we can't do any better. So why not shoot for the stars? Why not try to be like the master evangelist? Now some of the richest examples of personal evangelism are found in the Gospel of John. 
Jesus enters into an, a number of discussions. He, he performs the, the first miracle at the wedding at Cana in chapter 2, and uh, in between chapter 2 and 3, he probably does some other things, some other signs there that, that aren't written in John's gospel, but are included in other ones. And he enters into a series of discussions with people that are from completely different backgrounds. He talks to a religious guy. He talks to Nicodemus. He talks to a, a Samaritan woman at the well, which is what Levi read for us a moment ago. He talks to a Gentile official. He talks to a sick man at the pool of Bethesda. And we see that he's adapting his approach, uh, approach with each one of those people. And so what I would like to do over the next several weeks is, is kind of like what we did with the authority one, uh, the authority series. We, we looked at how Jesus viewed authority and how he used the scriptures. Well, let's look at how Jesus evangelized. Let's look at how Jesus converted people and got them interested in, in you know, drawing this living water that would well up to eternal life within them. But today, I just want to give you seven general lessons that we can notice uh, about Jesus' approach, and we'll get into those specific ones later. So the first point I want to make today about how Jesus approached people is that he took time for the individual. He took time for the individual. Now, this might not seem very important, but this is all important. Jesus, if you think about it, after his baptism, he had about, he had about three and a half years to accomplish his Father's will. He's got a very narrow window of time. And so time for Jesus is very, very precious. And yet, as Levi read from John 4, he spends an entire afternoon with one woman, at Jacob's well. I think that ought to cause us to pause. And that's a teachable moment. He's teaching us something there. He taught, yes, he taught the multitudes. He taught thousands of people at a time. But, but Jesus also took time for the individual. And that needs to be our attitude. He took time for Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when Nicodemus came to him in the middle of the night. And yet Jesus had time to explain how he had to be born again if he ever wanted to enter into the kingdom of God. And we see th this, this beautiful picture of this man, Nicodemus, who's just very tentative at first. He's curious about Jesus, and then his faith grows, and he stands up for Jesus later on. And later on, Jesus, he dies on the cross, and who is there? But Nicodemus is one of the man, men who, who care very reverently for his body. What about the sick man at Bethesda in John chapter 5? Here's this poor man, he, he can't walk and he wants to get into this water. And the, the Jews believe there in, in, in Jerusalem that the pool at Bethesda, an angel would come down and stir up those waters and they would have some sort of miraculous healing property for the very first person who got in the water. But this poor guy couldn't get in there. And so Jesus is walking by. He could have met eyes with anybody, but he meets eyes with this man. And his first question is, do you want to be made well? You see how he's, he's taking time for the, the individual. Pick up your pallet and walk, he says. In John chapter 9, he meets, he meets a blind man. And he could have snapped his fingers and gave him his sight, but no, he, he does something really weird. He spits on the ground and he makes mud and he puts it on the guy's eyes and he, and he heals this man in stages. He takes time to teach a lesson for this man and for, for you and I. Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19, here's this tax collector, a little short guy like this, and, and, and he climbs up in this tree and he spots Jesus and he's trying to get a glimpse. Jesus notices him. He's trying to notice Jesus. Jesus notices him and says, come on down from that tree. Salvation has come to your house. Wow. You know, he's talking to me? My point is, brethren, we lead, we lead busy lives. And, and we keep busy schedules, especially, you know, those of you who have children who are going to school and you're trying to run around from this thing to the other thing, and it's hard to find time. But I'll tell you something that's, that's really humbling. Jesus was busier than me, and he's busier than you. Is anybody here busier than Jesus during his ministry? No, I don't, don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> Jesus was, was so busy preaching the gospel, and yet he still finds time to pray. He still finds time to worship the Father. He still finds time to honor God on the Sabbath, and he still finds time for, for an individual 
to teach an individual the gospel. And we've got we've to have that mindset. Yes, we're busy, but we can't be too busy to reach out to one person. You know, teaching doesn't have to be by appointment. Teaching doesn't have to be in, in a church building. Teaching doesn't have to be in some sort of public venue when you're standing on a raised platform like me and you're talking to a group of people who actually want to hear you. That's not how all teaching takes place in some sort of controlled format where you control all the variables. Oftentimes, it's going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It's going to be informal. It's going to be spur of the moment. You're going to be sitting next to someone at a ball game and all of a sudden he's, he's dealing with something and you see your opportunity and that's where you got to go. You might not have your Bible in your pocket. But you can preach the gospel to him because it's in here. It's written on the tablet of your heart. You might be sitting down and getting your hair cut and all of a sudden you get into a discussion with your barber or your hairstylist. Or maybe you're sitting beside a well. Or the modern application, I don't know, you're at the water cooler or something. You get into a discussion there. That's how, that's how most of this stuff gets started. By the way, I want you to notice the effect of Jesus taking time with one person. It says in, in, uh, in John chapter 4 here that this woman left her water pot in verse 28, went into the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? And look what happened in verse 30. They went out of the city and were coming to him. Fast forward to verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him. Why? Jesus didn't go into the city. But the woman did. Because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. By the way, would you rather be like the Samaritan woman or, or an apostle? I think on the surface, I'd like to be like, like the, an apostle. But did you notice the apostles went into the same city? They didn't, they didn't convert anybody. <laughs> they went into the city to buy food. But that woman went into the city with a purpose to preach the gospel. Many people were converted. Jesus takes time for the individual, and you see how the gospel can spread there. One soul, one step at a time, one moment at a time. We've just got to be ready. We've got to do, as Peter says, sanctify the Lord. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Being ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you, yet you do it with gentleness and respect. Take time for the individual. Number two, something I noticed from this text is we want to ignore social constructs. Ignore social constructs. You know, Jewish men didn't talk to women in the first century in public. That was a no-no. Jewish men did not talk to Samaritans either. They had no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jewish men did not talk to women who were adulteresses. And yet, what do we have going on right here? A Jewish man certainly wouldn't talk to an adulterous Samaritan woman. None of that stopped Jesus. He didn't care about any of that. Here is the one human being on the face of the earth who could read the thoughts and the intentions of the heart, who could see into this woman's past. He is the only one who has the power to condemn anybody because he is the judge. And yet, what do we see Jesus doing? He's reaching out to this individual with words of hope. we we got we to gotta take a, a, a feather from his cap here. We, we need to learn that lesson. And put away all of the social constructs. We are very good at, at least me, I'll speak for myself, I'm very good at labeling other people. In my mind, mentally. Making prejudgments about somebody. Putting somebody in a box. Well, he belongs in this box. This is the kind of person that he is. Based on what I can see with my fleshly eyes. And so in my mind, I'm building these walls of division. And you might be doing this too. I'm constructing all of these barriers that are artificial. They only exist up here. They're not real. And it keeps me from reaching other people. It keeps me from seeing things from their point of view. It keeps me from seeing them as simply someone made in the image of God who's in desperate need of a Savior. We need to train our eyes to see people that way. 
ignore the social construct. Jesus didn't care about any of that. It didn't make a difference what people thought. He was going to talk to that woman. He knew what his job was to reconcile lost sinners to God through the cross. And Jesus continues to do that. He, he, he was able to bring two separate walls of society, Jewish people and, and Gentile people. He was able through the cross to do the impossible, to bring these people that, that had no dealings with one another for thousands of years, to bring them together, to bring them together in his body, in the church. If he can do that, he can do anything. He can bring anybody together. Remember when we read in Isaiah, he was this king of righteousness who would rule with equity and justice and mercy and compassion. In, in this new kingdom that he would, he would establish, you have these natural enemies. You have the lion and the lamb, and they're sitting right next to each other, dwelling in unity. People, he's still doing that today. One of, one of the greatest joys of a Christian was to worship with saints in... in um, in New York City with Rachel. And to see just, just the, the different cultures that were represented, the different languages that were represented. We all look different. I didn't have a whole lot in common with those people other than faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's what unites us. That's what brings us together. Ignore social constructs. Be like Jesus who reached out to people who didn't look like Him, who didn't dress like Him, who didn't act like Him, and who, who didn't believe like Him. But he reached out to them anyway, and he saved many. And he can save many through you and I. Number three, notice that Jesus took the initiative here in John chapter 4. He is the one who started the conversation. He says, give me a drink. Give me a drink. Brethren, how effective, how effective are we going to be as uh, our work in evangelizing the lost if we wait around at our, at our house, we close the door, and we're just waiting for someone to knock on our door and say, excuse me, um, I found this Bible, and I, I, I would like for you to explain it to me. You know? or, or I've been doing some thinking, and, and I, just, I just need to find my, my purpose in life. Could you please explain that to me? Could you please, I believe in God. Does he, have a, does he have a plan or something? I believe I'm a sinner, and I just don't know how to be saved. If that ever happens, call me right away. Because I, I want to meet this person. But when we take the initiative, when we go out, and we, st we are the ones who get the conversation started, we get the ball rolling, then we are actually in control of that conversation. We're able to move that discussion from something that is earthly to something that is spiritual. And notice how Jesus used that to his advantage. He ignored the social constructs and he started the conversation. And this woman was rocked back on her heels. She was caught off guard. You, a Jew, are speaking to me, a Samaritan woman? And he used that to work to his advantage. He got the ball rolling. And he was able to, to, to use that control of the conversation to, to work something spiritually into that conversation. You know, God has, has revealed His will to us. He's revealed His will to man. And just as He asked Isaiah, you know, uh, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Are we going to answer like Isaiah? Here I am. Send me. I will be the one to go. I will be the one to, to, to not just sit at home, but I'll be the one to go out. And I'll be the one to start the conversation. Let's not, let's not wait for someone to ask us about Jesus. God has already commanded us to go. And so let's go. That's right. <laughs> yeah. You can't, you can't substitute come for go. You can't think just, just by having a sign in the front yard, there's my evangelism. There's a sign that says it. It takes more effort than that. It's a labor. It's work. It's intensive. It takes time. We're going to fail. But we'll never get anything done if we don't try. And we don't get the ball rolling and we don't start that conversation. Continue to invite people to services. But understand, Jesus says, go and teach and make disciples of all nations. That's not just the preacher's job. That's not just the elder's job. That is the unshiftable responsibility of the saved. 
If you're a Christian, then you are obligated. You are duty-bound to love your neighbor. What greater way we can love our neighbor than to show them the gospel of Jesus Christ? That necessitates taking the initiative. But then the question comes, well, how, how should I teach? Well, can I suggest that you keep it simple? Keep it simple. The point of teaching is not to display our knowledge. The point of teaching is not to impress somebody or to win an argument. The point of teaching is to bring them to faith in Jesus Christ. It's to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. That's what God desires in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. Can I suggest to you lovingly, people don't need to hear about our views on the sea beast of Revelation. Folks don't need us to expound on the phrase because of the angels in 1 Corinthians 11. They don't need to hear about our wild theories about whether the sons of God in Genesis 6 are descendants of Seth or disobedient angels. What they need to hear is why Jesus died for them. What they need to hear is that Jesus is king. What they need to hear is that there is only one God. Keep it simple. Jesus kept it simple. He knew the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And he did so by, by simple teaching. And when the conversation takes a turn here in John chapter 4, he rolls with it. But he brings it back. He brings it back to the spiritual. He kept the focus on the kingdom. And he did so simple, si simply. And, and this, to me, I think is really important. Just in general, when you, when you hear Jesus and you read about him, here's a guy who's got perfect command of the language, like nobody else. He's got perfect knowledge he can run theological circles around the best of them. And yet, when Jesus stands up and opens his mouth, it's never lofty, it's never condescending, it's never pretentious. Just the opposite. As we sang, he's so lowly. He's so simple. Some of the most effective teaching of Jesus are, are these parables, these illustrations, these, these windows into into true spirituality that, that we could all understand. A third of those, of those parables, they reference farming. Things like wheat and, and tares and sowing seed and, and building barns and mustard seed and fig trees, this kind of thing. Everybody would have understood exactly what Jesus was saying. And then he draws it into something spiritual. He taught very simply. And we can convert more people if we would be simple in our approach. In John chapter 4, what did he use here to teach? He used what was available. He used his, what, what was right there, this well of, of water. He took something that was physically relevant. He drew the spiritual parallel. Let's keep it simple and straightforward when we're trying to convert our neighbors. Number five, start wherever they are. Start wherever they are. Now, I know we talked about this uh, on uh, last, last Sunday, but Jesus he just had a knack for meeting people on their level. I know he could read their heart. I know all of that. But I think if we truly love people, we try to you know, put ourselves in their shoes, then, then I think we can meet them on their level too. Jesus approached Nicodemus differently than he approached the woman at the well. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus was a, a very distinguished Jewish teacher. He would have been very familiar with the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah. And so Jesus draws heavily on language from Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel chapter 36 about a new heart, about this new birth, about the pouring out of the Spirit and all of that. But he doesn't go there with the Samaritan woman. Now he's preaching the same kingdom with the same message. He's just coming at it from a different angle. So we need to meet people where they are, not where we are, not where we think they should be. And of course, as we pointed out Sunday, the best example of this is Acts chapter 17. That's the best example. Paul is preaching the same gospel to, to the Jews as he did to these Athenians. But he doesn't quote any scripture when he goes to the Athenians. Now, the, the, the sermon that he gives on Mars Hill is so rich with biblical truth. But he goes on to quote their, their, own, their own poets. And, and he does so in, in a sensitive way. And... As we pointed out last Sunday, we're living in a world that is biblically illiterate, and that's okay. That's okay. We just need to meet people where they are. If they've never opened a Bible, then start at page one, you know, and be simple and start where they are. Let's be sensitive to where they are. Let's show them gentleness and respect. Show them some compassion. 
and see things from their perspective. Paul said, I've become all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. Now, he could have stormed into Athens. He could have condemned those, those idolatrous heathens, but instead he quotes their own poets in him. He sees the beauty of the gospel in some pagan literature. In him we live and we move and we have our being. That, that's, that's beautiful, but he, he sees the spiritual truth there. When bringing others to the truth, let's see where they are, start where they are. And I think the, the Bible is, is sufficient to take any of us from where we are to where we need to be. Number six, remember. Remember that God's Word is what saves. God's Word is what saves when we're going out and evangelizing the lost. Good examples are very important. Good examples can break the soil. They can till the, the fallow ground of the heart, so to speak. They can create interest. They can make it more receptive for the seed. And we can influence people in all the right ways, and that's important. We need to be living righteous and blameless lives. But my good example... My good example does not have the power to save someone's soul. And thank God, because nobody would be saved. If it depended on my example, then nobody would be saved. I fail. We all fail. We all stumble in many ways. But that power rests with God. Good examples are important, but the implanted word is what saves us. James chapter 1 and verse 21. When that word is meekly received, it has the power to save our souls. This is Peter says, it has the power to cause us to be born again by this living and abiding and enduring word of God. This is the gospel, Peter says, that I preach to you. It's able to cause you to be born again. And so how does God, God cause this, this great transformation? Well, for there to be, we have a part to play. We'll talk about this this evening, but we've got a part to play. He wants planters and he wants waterers. For there to be any fruit at all, there has to be a planting of the seed. And the seed is the word of God in the parable of the sower. And if the seed is the word of God, then that necessitates that we need to open up our mouths. Peter or, uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he viewed himself as an ambassador for Christ. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 20, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. It pleases God to make His appeal through fallible, imperfect human beings. And that is all on purpose. We have this treasure, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. We have this treasure of the gospel in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. If anybody is saved, it's not because of Jerome. It's not because of J.R. It's not because of Rod Cleary. Now, he had a part to play in that. But it's because of the power of God. It's because Rod opened up his mouth and took the time with the individual and had a Bible study with them or, or, or whatever. It's to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not, and not us. And so salvation is by grace through faith, but also that faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Paul says. So let's do our best to be a good example, to be living sacrifices, to walk worthy of our calling so that we don't bring reproach upon Jesus, upon His sacrifice, and upon His church. But let's rest on the power of God's Word to save. We plant, we water, but God causes the increase. I'll tell you, when, when you, when you believe that, when you really believe that, that takes the pressure off. Because all I am is a channel through which God can work. All I've got to do is just do my job and just sow the seed, or do my job and, and, and do the watering, whatever my job might be. Now, God is the one who causes the increase. He says in Isaiah chapter 55, in verses, uh, verse 11, He says, as the rain comes down from heaven, it waters the ground. It causes the ground to, to sprout vegetation. And it will not return unto me void. It's not going to go back to heaven without accomplishing exactly what I told that rain to do. And He says, that's, that's how my word is. It's going to do what I sent it down to earth to do. And so all we have to do is be like Isaiah, be like Ezekiel, warn our neighbors, teach our neighbors in compassion and love. Be like Paul, be all things to all people, and open up 
our mouths. Don't be discouraged about results. That's God's end of the stick. Let Him worry about that. He'll cause the increase. You just do your job and I'll just do mine. Our last point is this, brethren, very quickly. We need to give people hope as early in the discussion as we possibly can. I cannot emphasize that enough. Jesus knew this woman in John chapter 4 like nobody else had. He knew the woman's past. He knew that she was an adulteress. He knew that she'd been married five times and she was living this immoral lifestyle and yet he doesn't start with repentance. Neither should we. Now he eventually gets to repentance. He eventually gets to pointing out this woman's sinful lifestyle. And we're not ever suggesting that we ignore that. You can't, you can't teach the gospel without preach, doing some, some teaching on, on sin. Because you need to be saved from something, you know. But I want you to see that he offers hope to this woman in the form of living water. And that's what he opens with. That's his in. There's something that you need. There's something that would benefit you. Brethren, that's called tact. That's compassion. And, and I think sometimes that's missing when we approach our neighbors. Don't start out with a list of do's and don'ts. Don't start out, well, if you want to become a Christian, well, it's going to take this, 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 and this. Instead, we should first give them a reason to change their life. When you find out why Jesus died for you, you'd do anything for Him. You'd put your hand to the plow and you'd never look back. So you, when you're preaching to your neighbors and you're teaching your neighbors, put Jesus at the front. Put the cross at the forefront of our conversation. Even God does not expect service without motivation. God could just tell us, go do this. But more often than that, He gives us a reason to do it. Hey, Abraham, Go uproot your family. Take all of your, your herd with you and your wife and your kids and go to a place that you've never seen before. Period. No, he doesn't do that, does he? In Genesis chapter 12, he says, Abraham, I know you're old. I know you, don't, you probably don't think you're, you're going to have any kids, but I'm going to make you a great nation. And through you, Abraham, I'm going to work through you. And from your seed, I'm going to bring blessing to this entire world. Now, get up and go to Canaan. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's give them hope. Give them a reason to change. And we hear, we hear the same motivation whenever we open the Bible and we read the words of Jesus, especially when He invites us all. To come to me, he says, all you who are weary and heavy laden, are you sick and tired of making the same choices that are ruining your life? Are you sick and tired of being the victim of sin? Are you sick and tired of the way that your life is here? You're weary, you're heavy laden, you're weighed down with the problems of this life. Jesus says, you come to me and I will give you rest. You take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you would like to take on the yoke of Jesus, if you would like the hope that He's offering you through faith in Him, through, through coming under His authority, then He will give you rest. That is the promise of God. Bring you spiritual rest. I invite you now as we stand and sing this song to respond to this gospel message.